Coming up on DTNS, Google's version of the Windows browser ballot, but for search engines and Android. Amazon and Microsoft bid for Jedi money. And cord cutting, is it becoming too darn complicated? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 2nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, Sarah Lane's still out on another assignment, but we're very pleased to have Patrick Norton, host of AVXL, back on the show. Patrick, how you been? I am full of mirth and good cheer, Tom. I'm delighted. We were just talking about all the mirth and good cheer that the various <laughs> unlimited internet plans from mobile carriers bring us on Good Day Internet. <laughs> I love you so much, but when you lie, it hurts me. I know. I'm sorry. I shouldn't lie. Uh, but it, it was a good conversation, and you can get that if you are a patron and get Good Day Internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start this show with a few tech things you should know. Apple has followed Google in suspending its program to review a small percentage of Siri voice requests in an effort to improve responses. Apple says it will review the process of those reviewings and issue an update to Siri that gives users a choice to not participate in the review process. That's the first company I've heard to do that. And that is one of the things I think they should absolutely do. The US FCC voted to approve digital opportunity data collection rules. Those would require ISPs to provide more accurate maps of broadband coverage. <sighs> ISPs will need to provide geospatial maps of where they provide service rather than just being able to report a census block served by having one house connected or even not even having any houses connected, but being close to network facilities. Census blocks are between 600 and 3,000 people. Uh, they could count coverage if no one had service, but they were close. The new system will require smaller polygons of coverage uh, and actual connections or connections that only require you to drop cable. Like the lines there, they just haven't actually brought it into the house. You can't just say, oh, well, if we add a base station, if you need to add a base station, it's not a connection. The rules also call for the creation of a crowdsourcing system to collect public input on the accuracy of ISP coverage maps. Yes. So coverage maps going to get uh, better. I'm not saying they're perfect. They're not going to have price info on here, just speed, but better. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has joined the list of states' attorneys suing to block the merger of T-Mobile and Sprint, bringing the total number of states to 15. Remember that merger received approval from the Department of Justice and FCC with provisions for transferring some prepaid service, infrastructure, access, and spectrum to DISH. However, the objections of the state attorneys need to be resolved before that merger can occur. So keeping you up to date on that. All right, Patrick, let's talk a little more about Google's browser ballot. I mean, search engine ballot. <laughs> but but I want to yell about the FCC and the internet. Um, oh my goodness! So uh, okay. yeah, let me let me tell, tell the folks what's going on here. Google announced okay. uh, starting in early 2020, it will offer a search engine selection screen during setup of your Android device that will become the default search engine search engine on Android's home screen and in the Chrome browser. So far, so good. Uh, you're going to get a choice now. Along with Google, three other search providers will be offered with the options determined by sealed bid, indicating how much a company will pay per user selection. So you'll only get four options, Google and three others, and those three others will be determined by people bidding on how much they'll pay each time someone selects them as their default search engine. Search engine operators must meet a minimum bid and be among the three highest bids in order to show up on an EU country's search engine selection screen. It'll be different per country. And if fewer than three search engines meet the minimum bid, the remaining slots will be filled at random. Google, in justifying this, says an auction is a fair and objective method to determine which search providers are included in the choice screen. It lets search providers decide what value they place on appearing in the choice screen and to bid accordingly. The deadline for search providers to apply for inclusion is September 13th, with winning bids to be confirmed by October 31st. Okay, this is probably a step in the right direction and kind of a complicated mess. Um, and right, you know, it's ironic's not the right word, but you're talking about Google gets slammed with a $5 billion fine because they keep tying their apps and their services to their operating system, right. which sounds so familiar. Wherever did they get that game plan from? Um, you know, the, the mere fact that it's going to be like, you know, in your face, you get to choose your search engine. 
I think is a fantastic step. I also think 90% of the planet is automatically going to go Google because that's what they automatically do. Uh, you know, a bunch of people might choose DuckDuckGo, uh, which isn't going to be an option because I don't think they're going to be able to pay the money for this. I think it's going to be really, 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 really interesting to see who actually shows up as the other three. <laughs> yeah. I'm also, you know, uh, you know it, I also find it really interesting that Google is not saying what the minimum bid is. You know, well, it's probably uh, different for country is my guess. They're going to set, they're going to set a minimum for Germany and one for France and one for yeah. Italy. Yeah. You know, I'm also curious how they will randomly choose three, like, okay, it'll be a thousand per user. I want get... it to be on YouTube live with a big uh, ping pong ball thing full of all the names of the search <laughs> engine providers. So we can see that it's actually random. Yeah. I don't think that's how it's going to, this is, you know, this is in, in some sense, this is, you know, you know, the whole joke about the engineer on top of the building in, 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 in the Western United States. And, and he yells, you know, you're above me in the air. And somebody's like, oh, I'm in Redmond in Washington, because that's such a Microsoft danger because it's technically correct, but completely useless. Like this mm -hmm. is one of those classic moments where we're going to get the EU off our, our, our collective posteriors. And we're going to do it in a way that makes it as difficult and unclear as possible. Well, I, I think uh, if I were to take the side of Google, uh, what I would imagine Google might want to say if, if they were uh, not worried about you know, every single word that they choose in public is that if they don't do this, how should they pick which search engines show up? Uh, if you pick every search engine available, that's going to be a long list. There's more search engines out there than people think, especially when you right. get in specialty search engines. So how do you narrow it down? Uh, the browser ballot was a little easier because there were fewer major browsers. You could go specifically by market share, except in this case, Europe's market share is pretty much all Google. So if they're like, well, we don't want to pick the winners and losers, let's make a system that allows the search engines that have the resources to provide good service get on the ballot. And one way to do that is a bid. Now, why there's a minimum there, I'm not certain about. Maybe that's a way to ensure quality. I don't know. Maybe that's um, <laughs> a way to ensure that that it's the most desperate, well-funded. I, I mean, you know. that, that's where the guy who want, who's counting the beans comes in and goes, let's put a minimum in, you know, so we can make sure we get at least, a, you know, some decent bids from these people. Um, but yeah, I mean, how do you select this search engine ballot in a way that's useful for people that doesn't have doesn't leave Google exposed to being the one that's picking who should win or lose if they don't pick Google. Well, I, I, I don't know. It's it's on some level, you know, when you when you look at like it's like Gabriel Weinberg, um, the CEO of DuckDuckGo was basically like it's got four slots consumers are barely going to get any choices, right? Because, you know, when you start thinking about listing, OK, we probably still knows about Yahoo, Google, Yahoo you know, sophisticated kind of, you know, privacy oriented people know about DuckDuckGo. I think you start realizing there are literally, you know, two dozen that you've never heard of that are out there competing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the fact that it's pay to play bothers me. The fact that it's not truly random bothers me. Not that truly random would be a good thing. In fact, right. I think truly random would benefit Google because if they throw a bunch of- up against some people you've never heard of and everybody like, yeah, I'm definitely picking Google because I don't even know who yeah. those are. Yeah. I mean, when you don't realize- forget, don't, don't forget, you can pick- any search engine to be your default search engine. This isn't changing the behavior right. of Android. You can go in and change it yourself. This is just saying at setup, we're going to suggest a few. We're going to make you pick one right. instead of having Google be the default and you having to go in and change it. Yeah, but I think Google is still going to be the default for most people because most people like Google yeah. equals search engine. The challenge, I think, is that you know, this makes it I mean, one and okay, okay, you obviously get a choice during setup, but they've rigged it so that it's probably going to be them and a bunch of people you've never heard of. Well, um, they will be, it'll be random ordering. So Google won't always be the top choice. And the auction is meant to be like, well, the companies that have the resources probably are the most likely for you to recognize. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Bing, it's going to be Google and Bing. Eh, not everyone. Google, right. Bing, maybe Yahoo. <laughs> maybe Yahoo. Uh, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is investigating an agreement between Amazon and Apple to sell Apple products directly on Amazon. Remember when we talked about this as part of the deal, Amazon agreed to only let Apple authorized resellers sell Apple products on Amazon. And that got rid of a lot of small sellers of refurbished items because to be an authorized reseller, you have to handle a lot of products uh, and smaller 
resellers don't qualify for that. A Minnesota man named John Bumstead says he was contacted by a group of FTC officials who wanted to know how selling on Amazon and eBay worked for him and how being barred from selling Apple products on Amazon has affected his business. So it, they, this is part of a broader effort uh, to investigate anti-competitive behavior by big tech companies. Uh, but it is interesting that this particular deal is under that scrutiny. Yeah, it's so peculiar. I mean, it's also been so odd to watch Amazon as they've fought with Google, they fought with Apple, they fought with anybody who competes with them. Um, and ironically, it never seems to be Amazon that's getting investigated. <laughs> you know, so maybe this is when, you know, the FTC becomes more like, gosh, Amazon does some really pesky things for consumers. <laughs> well, because a lot of the attention on tech companies, I think, up until now has been around data handling and Amazon has an advertising program, but it's a very small one. So they weren't the biggest abuser of your personal data. Uh, Now they have gotten so big that people are starting to notice how they use their market dominance in retail. Uh, And so this is an example of that, whether, whether it's an abuse or not is what the FTC is investigating it, but they certainly have a dominance and are able to swing these deals because of it. It's going to be, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, Nintendo and Tencent announced more details on how the Switch console will be rolled out in China. Tencent will host servers and cloud services for Switch's online platform, handle localizing the game in simplified Chinese. The Nintendo eShop uh, will support Tencent's WeChat payment system. And Nintendo confirmed that Super Mario Odyssey and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild will come to the Chinese market. No date or price was given. Uh, the company still need some more government approval before this can actually happen. And if you're wondering, China had a ban on consoles from 2000 to 2015. The PS4 became the first of the modern consoles to return to China in 2015. So this is still kind of a new process for Nintendo to get into the Chinese market. They have to have a partner. And Tencent may or may not be the best partner. Tencent's had some problems getting their video games approved uh, by the Chinese government. And that has been hurting their bottom line as well. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Tencent is a company a lot of people don't know of outside of Asia. It is a massive, huge holding company inside of Asia. You know, so much of what people think of as the internet and a lot of uh, experiences is basically WeChat, which would be kind of like, in some level to me, sounds so much like experiencing the internet as Yahoo circa 1996 or 1997. I was still, I'll be honest with you, like I'm excited because the Switch is already doing so well as a platform. I mean, it's it's just doing amazingly well. They're going to open up this huge market in China, assuming they get government approval. But the thing that blew me away was still the idea that there was a ban on consoles from 2000 to 2015. And me sitting there like wondering like, what was the entire sort of black market for imported consoles in China? like you know um were they everywhere already or or is it it's something where like nobody really did much gaming other than on ancient no no the market the market effect was that china became the one of the biggest video game markets in the world for desktop and mobile and uh, and and that's why you you know things like world of warcraft so popular in china and mobile gaming there is huge because that's where you could game yeah and that's also the what everybody could afford i think was phones too Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and, and mobile phones definitely, uh, you know, were, were a booming market in China. They're finally starting to level out like they are uh, in the rest of the world. They're still kind of a booming market in India, look to be becoming a booming market in Africa, uh, lots of places in Africa anyway. Um, But yeah, uh, anyway, anyway, good, good to see that Nintendo has found a partner in China. I'm still curious if this is all going to fall apart uh, because of Tencent's previous issues, but we'll see. Uh, And the U.S. Department of Defense has delayed a decision to award a contract for the development of its Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure. That's J-E-D-I. That is the JEDI program. Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure are the last two bidders being considered to run the program. Google actually withdrew its bid uh, after some employee pressure. Uh, The JEDI program will offer AI analysis, host classified information, and provide a few other services. The contract is for 10 years and worth around $10 billion. So this is a big, fat government contract for Microsoft or Amazon to get. U.S. Secretary of Defense Dr. Mark T. Esper just took over his position July 23rd. Previously, he was the Secretary of the Army. Uh, So he's familiar with this contract, for sure, being the Secretary of the Army. But in his new position, he told Congress when he was confirmed that he would look over this contract to make sure that 
the government was getting its money's worth. Amazon had been expected to win the Jedi contract before the pause. It has an existing contract with the CIA, so it's got some experience handling classified information. And Microsoft is actually expected to win a different contract, the Defense Enterprise Office Solution or DIOS contract. I'm really sorry that that doesn't spell S-I-T-H, but uh, that contract involves providing email, calendar, video calling, and other productivity tools to the U.S. military. So it was looking like Amazon's going to get $10 billion for Jedi, but don't worry, Microsoft's going to get $8 billion for DIOS. Uh, and right now, anyway, the Jedi program is being held up. I'm kind of curious to see where this is. I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm still deeply fascinated by the CIA kind of outsourcing its cloud, uh, which is the whole point of putting something on the cloud. And the whole idea of the defense infrastructure will probably be more secure and, and more available. Um, I'm kind of curious how this sorts out because one of the claims, uh, one of the one of the 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 complaints I said would say from Marco Rubio is that eh, this was really arbitrary. How did they come to this decision? And uh, it was, you know, the, the more you dig into it, it's uh, the more you got to wonder, like, why are they stopping this now instead of picking someone? And uh, I guess also if I was going to be dealing with this day in and day out, I might as well. <laughs> if people are going to hang me for the decision being made on my watch, I'd probably want to take a closer look at the contract myself, too. Or the Yeah, you know, the entire... that is reasonable. Uh, um, it's also reasonable to note that Oracle fell out of the bidding uh, and really wanted this contract, uh, but they they the the uh, the bidding process eliminated them, uh, and they didn't want to be eliminated. And <laughs> they're very supportive of of Senator Rubio. Uh, those oh. are just all facts that I stated in 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 a particular <laughs> order. Uh, not trying to connect any dots there. You can do that yourself. Well, I you just connected them because I may have you know teed up something for you to whack. <laughs> Because I was trying so hard not to say this just reeks of politics. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there's more to this uh, than 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 just uh, I'm new to the job. Let me take a look at this because he was secretary yeah. of the army. He he, he knows this contract, um, yeah. but that and doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing to to review it if it's reviewed in a fair way, and 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 especially if maybe it uh, it finds some some loopholes and things that need to be tightened. I would be very curious to see how it ends up and then how the decision gets justified because obviously yeah, yeah. Oracle's going to be, as long as it's not Oracle, Oracle's going to be pissed and they're going to do everything. They, I mean, it's just, that's Oracle, right? It's just, it is what they are as a, as a company. Um, but it's also interesting, like to watch, you know, like one of the things the article, the BBC article notes is like, well, maybe they don't want to order, they don't want to have, you know, both contracts handled by the same company or, you know, and something, you know, maybe it's just because certain people in certain places hate jeff bezos and everything that makes him money like it's 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 all very peculiar it's all messy i guess yeah uh, at this ibm point. was was up for this contract too and also got uh eliminated from the bid process uh just just to be fair and, and say it wasn't just oracle that got eliminated so uh folks if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes there's a great way to do that go subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com at its Television Critics Association press tour Thursday, CBS All Access said it will offer 12 original series in 2020 with additional plans to expand programming into sports, movies, and nonfiction titles and series acquisitions. New offerings will include World Series of Poker bracelet events, the documentary Console Wars about the Nintendo versus Sega era, and streaming rights for the CW series Nancy Drew. President and COO Mark DeBevois addressed questions about the increasingly crowded field of streaming services saying he noted consumers subscribe to an average of 3.4 subscription services and noted that all access has 12,000 pieces of content versus 8,000 from stars and 3,000 from HBO. Very telling that he compared himself to premium services, not to Netflix and Hulu. On April 2019, poll by Hub Entertainment Research found that the plurality of respondents to a survey agreed with the statement, the network a show is on makes no difference to me. So we've got a couple of things going on here. We have CBS All Access saying like, we think we're the choice. We've got all these pieces of content. We've got great originals coming. Uh, we think we're a better value play. But you have people out there going, I don't know what any of these names are. I just want to watch my show. Hollywood right. Reporter survey found that people say they're willing to pay $21 a month for streaming. Now, keep in mind, most of those people are still paying for cable. So maybe that number changes if they actually cut the cord entirely. But it's still not a lot. I think, and I want to talk with Patrick about this. I think we've got a few different kinds of viewers here. There are the hoarders, 
the ones who want to have access to everything. And those people are the loudest and most upset because it's getting more expensive, expensive to have access to everything when you have so many different providers of television. You have the laybacks who just want to turn something on. Maybe sometimes it's news or sports. Maybe it's reality TV. Maybe it's like, I just want to see what's on. Uh, those people have some interesting free options that we'll mm -hmm. talk about. And then there are selectives. Uh, I probably count myself in that, which is I have a few shows that I definitely have to watch and I will pay for whatever service has them. Star Trek Discovery, yeah, I take my money, CBS All Access. Star Trek Picard, yep, I'm there. We have some changing conditions too uh, that are affecting people's opinions about this. The amount that you pay for traditional cable or satellite is declining. Part, some, sometimes it's declining because you're canceling cable and that you know $100 is out. Uh, sometimes it's because you're getting a skinny bundle. Uh, where you're like, I just need to pay for the broadcast channels. That's it. Over the top services are making it cheaper. PlayStation View, Sling TV, YouTube TV. We talked about them raising prices, but their prices still are usually less than you'd pay for cable. Original shows are also not available on DVR anymore. It used to be you paid for cable, you DVR'd everything, and all your shows were there. Uh, now you have to make choices. There's a psychological burden of like, okay, I can't just DVR it. So how do I make sure I have the services that have the shows I want to watch? Uh, and this is being caused by the originals coming from multiple different streaming services and being exclusive to those streaming services. And we have multiple content producers attempting to grab market share for the streaming budget. So we have way more streaming services than we need right now, as every one of them thinks they're the one who can survive. Right. My predictions are, we still have yet to see some more live TV services focusing on sports and news. That's the piece of this puzzle that's only kind of blanket covered by your Sling TVs and your PlayStation Views and your YouTube TVs. Uh, and I think something bigger is coming there. That's going to affect this whole landscape. I think budgets are going to change as people adjust to not paying $100 a month, which depending on what you look at, the average cable bill in the U.S. is somewhere around $100 from 85, I saw up to 120, but it's somewhere in there. Uh, if you're not paying that, that changes that $21 amount a little bit. And not all these new services are going to survive. I think some of these companies are going to switch from providing uh, a streaming service to making shows for other streaming services. We're going to have a limited number of subscribers. And there's still the, the shakedown in free services. A lot of people don't realize that Pluto TV, Vudu, IMDb TV, Roku, Crackle, Tubi, the list goes on, right. provide absolutely free. And those laybacks are like, I just want to watch something. Maybe fine just turning on Pluto TV most of the time. So <laughs> hey, here's where we are. It's a It's a mess. It's hard to tell where your money is going and how to budget for it. And if you just wish for the simple days, I've got one bill and that got me everything. Well, those days are gone right now. So it's funny because part of the reason I wanted to bring this up um, was because I've, I've been looking. First of all, uh, I will point out that at, when we last had satellite and cable, our bill was extraordinarily high because of where we lived at the time. And so it was really easy for me to realize three things. One, I don't need, you know, thousands of the channels they're offering or i should more accurately say you know two or three hundred of the channels they were offering were of no interest to me um and i'm also i i, I can also sit down and be like wow it's a korean translation of a three-year-old poker game that i didn't want to watch three years ago but this is fascinating and uh <laughs> so you know for 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 you know my ability to sleep uh it was a very good thing for me to get rid of uh cable and uh uh satellite but uh it was interesting to watch, right? Because a lot of people, when they started, when they started cutting their cord, they were, you know, in the early Netflix days, Netflix had the carriage agreement that got through stars and everything was on Netflix and people react to, uh, people are still ticked off about everything not being on Netflix. I, and it's interesting I, to watch I, that. I want to address that because that is a okay. psychological fallacy. Everything was not on Netflix. In fact, it seemed compared to Netflix for years was that they don't have everything. And then when they started to lose things is when right. people started to characterize it. Well, Netflix used to have everything and now they don't have stars. They're going to die. And then they didn't. Well, Netflix used to have Disney and now they don't. Now they're going to die. And they didn't. Well, it's just, I mean, it, it is a psychological thing. Netflix has never had everything. It's it's that psychological thing where when we lose something, we see, we notice that more. Okay. So first of all, thank you for calling out my hyperbole. Uh, <laughs> Netflix used to have an astonishing array of content, admittedly at a relatively low resolution for an incredibly low price, dot, dot, dot. So 
what's I been think interesting it still has an astonishing array of content it yes. certainly doesn't have it at the low price though right yeah and it's gotten somehow it's managed to get harder and harder to discover but that's a, a search engine uh issue that i won't get into right now but it has been for me it's been interesting to watch as everyone whether it's netflix or amazon prime or eventually later this year apple and any of 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 what feels like dozens but are probably maybe a dozen core uh streaming services you know uh, i started realizing how many things i was tapping into to get access to a particular program you know for for me like there's almost nothing i want to watch on cbs all access except for the star wars star wars except for star trek and it was not worth it for me to do that now i may finally break down and do that but it's been interesting to i've talked to people where they are sort of managing like okay i'm going to sign up for this for this bunch and bin watch a bunch of stuff then cut it off and then i'm going to go over to here and watch this um for me it's been interesting because you know i got an access to stars so i can watch american gods i got access um to showtime so i could watch roadies and it's been interesting to watch how these things as more and more places split off to create their own channels and you know hopefully their own content uh it's been curious to watch how that's impacted for example uh you know netflix bidding all of the money to maintain friends on the netflix platform versus yes i think the overreaction to uh you know disney moving off of netflix to start the sort of you know disney and marvel standalone channels uh you know it was interesting for me because a whole bunch of content that my kids really enjoy was on Netflix. Um, for example, Phineas and Ferb. Phineas and Ferb ended up like, you know, the contract ended, all the content disappeared. A few weeks later, it showed up on Amazon. And in the meantime, I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. And I bought the best possible, you know, format of that so I could permanently own that moving into the future. It's been interesting to watch because it, it's shifting. And at some point, you can be like, okay, my capable is going to be huge this month if a whole bunch of stuff launches from a whole bunch of channels and I want to watch it all. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest thing is think about the explanation that Patrick was just making right now, folks. He was a, he's talking about people saying, I'll sign up for one month and then I'll cancel. You couldn't do that in the cable days, right? Right. You can actually control this. It's gone from, uh, well, I have a cable bill and there's not much I can do about it to, well, I have total control over how much I spend. I just have to make a decision about what I want to spend it on. Right. And it was nicer when you could just blame the cable company for that and say, well, I don't have a choice than having to have responsibility for it. And I think that's right. part of what's bugging people. Yeah. And it's also, it's been interesting to watch how difficult some channels have made it to sort of start or stop their channel, um, you know, which is I, you know, I was also laughing because you know, I was dealing with a third party service that has nothing to do with streaming uh, except for hosting RSS services. And there is literally no way to cancel their service once you stop using it. And then you had to email, then the email was ignored. And eventually I had to cancel payments to the, the automated payments uh, through my credit card provider because there was literally no one was answering and there was no way to make the, the payments go away. But that wasn't a streaming service, you're saying? That wasn't a streaming service, okay. but I think about the times- I you know, found it to be quite easy to cancel all of these services. Uh, I, I found it ridiculous. I found it surprisingly easy, I should say. You know, and also it can be interesting if you end up organizing through, if you if it is a subset of a different service you use, that's where it gets kind of interesting. Like I still have no idea. I, let me rephrase that. I still have not committed the energy to figure out how to shut down stars on my Amazon Prime account. <laughs> uh, you know, Brian Brushwood uh, raves about how easy that is on the Amazon Prime account. So some of it's just user interface and and whether you luck into finding out the place. Because I, I, uh, I know that that is one of the advantages is you get it all in one bill if you do it right. through Amazon. Uh, and Amazon lets you start them and stop them uh there's there's no prevention of that it's like you right. say you do have to know where to look to, to find it nothing is usually easy on amazon's site i found that to be true it consistently not easy i, yeah. I don't know i mean the, the, we're also in a situation uh where we do have an embarrassment of riches whereas if okay so you started stars and it's like oh i've got american gods look at this selection of additional movies that are not available the other things i subscribe to um it is curious to watch right because you know uh, i think you'll agree with me that the golden age of television was certainly not the 1950s not to take anything away from it you know but the array of content and the availability of content is getting incredibly extraordinary um it is also still kind of an exciting challenge to figure out where something is and yeah. you know the best way to get a hold of it um, I, I, my, my theory for years has been we're trans we're transferring from a system that was different to a system where television is like books 
You'll never be able to read all the books. You'll never be able to watch all the TV shows. And you certainly don't expect to have a service that gives you access to all the books in the world all the time. Uh, and, and I think we're going to have to shift our way of thinking about television shows to that same way. I also find myself buying more discs again than I did in the past for a while. Yeah, I think I think people need to figure that in. And again, it, it's part of the thing of like, well, now I have to do a lot more thinking about TV than I used to. And I don't like that. And I know, and, and that's not <laughs> fair. But if you're saving money on that hundred dollars on a cable, maybe you spend some money buying you know, digital copies, Blu-ray copies, whatever. Right. Uh, and then you've got them. Uh, you, you don't, you don't lose access to them and Netflix can't, you know, lose a contract and they disappear. Always well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. In the mailbag today, uh, we had a few people with different perspectives on AI. Uh, yesterday, we talked about how patent law could or should apply to creations by artificial intelligence. And we got some other areas of intellectual property law that people think need resolving. Robert wondered what's being done about all the AIs creating books and music. Uh, because there are plenty of that. And uh, yeah, uh, there's a, a, just do a search for AI uh, books and music copyright, and you'll find tons of think pieces about what should happen, but nobody's got the answer yet. And Brian was curious how we'll handle liability of AI. That's something that is being worked out right now in the autonomous car world. Uh, but the, again, I don't think there's a solution for it exactly, other than, well, for now, I guess the company making the autonomous car is going to take on the liability, but uh, none of our intellectual property law is equipped to handle any of this well yet. No. But Thank you, Patrick Martin, uh, for joining us. Uh, folks want to find out more of what you got going on. Where should they go? Uh, AVXL.com. Robert Heron and I are uh, relaunching the show. Uh, new show coming up next week. Uh, that would be a good place to find me uh, or uh, head over to Twitter, twitter.com slash Patrick Norton, and you'll find out what's coming out as it comes out. And of course, I still do This Week in Computer Hardware every week with Sebastian Peake, who's the editor-in-chief over at pcper.com, and that's twit.tv slash twich if you want to hear a couple of, of people geeking out about hardware in a geeky manner. Listen, folks, if you enjoy the independent perspective that we bring on tech news, uh, we enjoy bringing it. And the only way we're able to bring that is through independence provided by you. If you fund us, we stay independent. And we're able to talk about this in that weird way where we're considering multiple sides of an issue instead of coming at it to drive buzzy clicks or satisfy an advertiser. So if that sounds like a good idea to you and you're not already doing so, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Sarah's back on Monday. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>